And as for thy nativity, in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitieth thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou was cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day thou was born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, Live. Yea, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, Live. I invite you to pray with me, please. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, as you speak through your word, let there be a real silence come upon our hearts so that we can listen. Listen to that still small voice that somehow penetrates through all the other voices that we can hear God speak today. Amen. There is a God, and it's not you. Is that a shock? I hope you don't say that to anybody around you. I heard somebody say this the other day, and I thought, who is he saying that about? Oh, it's me. What a great habit to get into. How would you like to actually start that habit today? I'm not meaning to turn to the person next to you and say it, but to say it to yourself. Would you mind just closing your eyes for a few seconds and to say to yourself, there is a God. It is not me. Try that. Ever since Adam and Eve heard the devil say to them, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will be like God. And the human race has been trying to be like God ever since. And part of what this means is that your life is not your project. Your life is God's project. And when I try and make my life my project, I'm really trying to be like God. Now, this makes a lot of sense when we read the text found in Ephesians 2 verse 10. And it says, uh, we are His, what is the word? Workmanship. Other translation says we are his masterpiece. I like the other one best that says we are his handiwork. So we are his workmanship created in who? Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are not your handiwork. You are God's handiwork. Disappointed or relieved? Maybe curious. What does this really mean? So I want you to take step by step with me looking at this text found in Ephesians 2 verse 10. Because first of all, it is saying there that we are created. And that word created here is not referring to physical creation, spiritual creation. But the word for created here in the Greek is the same word used back in the Hebrew for created, for creation, the same word. And that word means to call into existence from nothing. And what that means today for us is, since my life is not my project, my life is God's project is, that God does not add to what I do. God doesn't add to what I come up with. Because the word created says, in spiritual, 
spiritual terms, that we are created in the same way as He created us physically, He has created us spiritually, and it is always to call into existence from nothing. He's not building on our foundation. He's not doing that at all. So just as God brought physical life into being, God is also bringing spiritual life into being. That's a fascinating thought, that Adam and Eve had nothing to do with the life that God created them to be. And we actually have nothing to do in creating, in causing, in bringing about, bringing about the spiritual life that only God brings about. That fits very well with saying, I am not my project. My life is not my project. I am His handiwork. Are you beginning to see the implications of that as you think about it? And the other thing about that is, is this. The first, which is the creation of the physical, God did with His power, but the second, which is the creation of the spiritual, He does by His what? His grace. He does by His grace. Now, I want us to stop for a moment again. Every time I hear the word grace, I want to say to myself, what do they mean by the word grace? It's one of those words that just flown around, thrown around so much, I want to know for sure, what do they really mean by grace? And I just have a very simple way of looking at grace, and that is that God does for me what I cannot do for myself and what I can never deserve to do or get. Simple as that. Grace is what God is doing for me that I cannot do and I cannot deserve. Is that simple? That's grace. So here it is. When God creates the spiritual, that means when He's building my life, when He is taking me on as His project, He is in fact doing something from scratch, from nothing, and He's doing something that I cannot do, nor can I deserve. I cannot contribute to God's work. I cannot make it happen. So, now, that's the first thing. The word created, here it is. Now, look at the next step in this passage. We are created, it says, in Christ Jesus. What does that mean to be created in Christ Jesus? You were born in maybe a hospital. I wasn't. I was born in someone's home. But what does it mean when we are created, in the spiritual sense, in Christ Jesus? Very simply, what it's really saying there is, is that God's handiwork in creating us, making us, forming us, shaping us, developing us, that handiwork of God's is simply this. It is creating us only because of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, that's quite a startling statement because that means that you and I, not only can we not do anything in our spiritual lives that is going to be of any substance, it's going to be what God wants it to be, we cannot do it, it's done by grace, but the other fact of that is God would not even do it if it wasn't because of the life and the death of Jesus Christ. God can have very little to do with us if it wasn't for the life, the death of Jesus Christ. Except be our judge and consume us because God is a consuming fire and we are sinful. And His grace is only there because there is the life, the death of Jesus Christ so that God can apply His grace to us. So I want you to take hope in the fact here that you, your life is not your project. It's God's project. He brings it about out of nothing. He does it because you cannot do it, and He does it because. You see, this is the beautiful thing. If God does it because I'm deserving it somehow, or I've earned it, or I'm good enough for it, or I'm worth it, it'll never get done. But if God is going to do that work in your life as His project because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's a guaranteed done thing. Because that is a permanent thing. That can never change. The perfect life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus is real. It's a fact. And that's the basis upon which why God can do what He does. You are God's handiwork because Jesus, listen, 
you are God's handiwork because Jesus did the saving work. You are God's handiwork because Jesus did the saving work. I just love to hear one amen from everyone once in this sermon. Would you say that? All right, there we go. I mean, that's just very cool. Maybe that made me say this because here's the proof of it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Read it with me, everybody. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, that person is a new creation. A new creation. He makes it from scratch. He does it with His power, by His grace. Not because I'm going to deserve it or anything of that. So the new life that God creates is what? In us is the life of Christ. Is the life of Christ. So there is that second step. We are created in Christ Jesus. But there's another step in this passage. It says, for good works. We are created for good works. What does that mean? Well, I want you, you to understand something here. And that is that created good works are, in fact, indispensable to salvation. I did say that. Good works are indispensable to salvation not as a basis or a means for salvation, but as its consequence and its evidence. Everyone should say amen to that. <laughs> Good works is indispensable to salvation. But think of it as a consequence and as an evidence. You see, we are not saved because of good works, but we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the target. That's the purpose. That's where it's going. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's take the next step here. We, when we talk about being which God prepared for beforehand for us, is a wonderful thought here, is because those good works that we are saved for, that was prepared in the past eternity. God in eternity has been planning your life. That is a stunning thought. You know what that tells me? You're not a last minute idea in God's mind. He didn't come up with this in a hurry because he was running out of time. God put his very best into designing you. And if you would take that seriously, he put his best in that. Not an afterthought. Not at all. In fact, my friend, take this to heart. God is making what? The best version of you. That's what he's doing. And I know what you're feeling right now because when I thought about these things and prayed about them and, and tried to figure out how am I going to say it, the thought that struck me all the time was, come on, come on. I'm nothing to reflect the best version of me. I'm not there. Well, hang on now. Hold on to your seat for a moment because we'll certainly have to consider that. This passage also says, yes, he did this. He prepared this beforehand so that we should what? Walk in them. That means we are not passive in this whole thing. We are not passive. Because maybe you thought, of, what is this guy saying? We do nothing? We're not passive in this. You see, God produces the good works in us. And what do we do? We walk in them. And in the Greek and the Hebrew, walk is a Hebrew idiom for our manner of life. But notice what comes first. What comes first is God's creative act out of nothing, which we could not do and could not deserve, therefore it's out of grace, and is something God has planned not just before we were born, but in the past eternity, if we try to understand that. And he's done all of that because of Jesus Christ, not because of anything that we have done or will do. It is that he's done all that for us to walk in what he creates. Please get this. 
please get this. Good works is walking with God. It is not working toward God. Now, that, un- that changes everything because so many people are under the impression that we have to work, we have to walk and work and strive and do everything, try hard towards the point where God wants us to be. But this all says that we are God's workmanship, God's handiwork. He's the one that will get us from here to there, and our job is to walk with Him. We walk with Him. That's very different to walking ahead of Him or even behind Him. We walk with Him. Therefore, take to heart today just this very simple statement. God's plan is to make you the best version of you. The best version of you. Guess what? He's doing that right now. He's doing that right now. Part of that making you the best version of you is that he brought you here today. And he'll take you home or take you to some other place, part of that working. Maybe you've thought about what you would want your life to be. What would you want your life to be? I want to say scrap it because it's nothing compared in importance or in being as special, as good as the life that God is shaping right now. God has many tools to His disposal and is very patient in what He is doing in developing the best version of you. Question is, do you have a long way to go? (laughs) I sure do. Rick, thank you. Yes, he says yes. I say yes as well. So how do we know it's all going to get done? I am certain, says Paul in Philippians 1 verse 6, and he's not talking about himself here now. He says, I am certain that God who began the good work within you. Here's the preacher talking to his congregation. And he says, I am certain that God, and he doesn't know their hearts. He doesn't, can't read their minds. He's not living with them 24-7 to know what they are doing. And yet he is certain that God who began the good work within you, Fletcher Church, will continue. Whose work? His work. His work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus, Christ Jesus returns. Is that good news or what? Now in the meantime, how is God doing? I didn't ask you how you are doing. How is God doing? Do you like what he's doing? What's his handiwork achieving? How do you feel about the progress that is being made of God's handiwork in you? Are you walking what he is working? There was a young fellow, a very young boy, who went into a telephone booth one day, and he left the door open, and just as he was to begin speaking as he was dialing the number, a lady came to that same telephone booth. She wanted to use it, found it occupied, so she stood outside and couldn't help but hear this one-sided conversation that was coming out of the booth. And uh, here's what she heard. This little fellow was on the phone there, and here's uh, the words that she heard. She heard him say, hello, is uh, this 7162 South Main Street? Is this Mr. Jones? Oh, Mr. Jones, do you need a good, lively errand boy? Oh, you have one. Well, are you going to keep the one that you have? Oh, you are. Is he okay? You really like him, do you? Well, all right. Thank you. Goodbye. And he stepped out, and this lady looked at him and said, Never mind, young fellow, you look like a smart young guy. I'm sure you'll get a job somewhere. And he says, Me? Find a job? I've got one. I'm Mr. Jones' errand boy. I was just checking up on myself. (laughs) Checking up on myself. The Bible tells us to do that 
But please notice how it does that. Because in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine. Isn't she beautiful? If it wasn't for that mirror, she might believe it. What do you think? Examine yourselves to see if your faith is what? Genuine. Now, let me tell you how many people like to read that passage. They like to put it this way and say, examine yourself and see how well you are doing. That's not what the text says. Examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Another way of saying that is if your relationship with Jesus is genuine. Test yourself. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is in you. So that's the test. The test is not to see how well I'm doing. The test is to find out to make sure that Jesus Christ is in you. But didn't we say that we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus? We are created in Christ Jesus. It is the life of Jesus Christ that God creates in us. And here Paul says, examine yourself, test yourself to see. Make sure that Jesus Christ is in fact in you. And if not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Please, friends, it doesn't say examine yourself to see how well you are doing. It doesn't say that. That's navel-gazing. It does say, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine, if Jesus is in you. Well, how do you know if Jesus is in you? Is that the question on your mind? Well, Jesus told us. He said, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will produce much fruit. That's what Jesus said. What fruit? Well, Paul explains that to us in Galatians 5. He tells us, it, we call it the fruits of the Spirit. That is Christ in you. That's what those, spirit, those fruits of the Spirit are. What are they? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That, my friends, that is the life you never knew you wanted. Because your faith is genuine when your life bears fruit, bears the fruit which God is producing in you. You can substitute that word fruit, put there in its place, Jesus Christ. Because that is the personification of Jesus Christ. It's the life I never knew I wanted. Take these steps with me. I'll get real personal here and tell you about the life I never knew I wanted because I wanted a life of being loved. But God is producing as His handiwork. He is producing instead a life of giving love. See, that's Jesus. I wanted a life of pleasure, on my terms, my kind of pleasure, God is producing instead a life of joy. And you know what happens to the pleasure we go after. It doesn't last. It doesn't hold. It doesn't deeply satisfy. It's always a superficial satisfaction. But the joy that Jesus gives, that is lasting and forever. I wanted a life of conquering challenges wired that way, but God is producing instead a life of peace. Can you relate to that? I sure can. I wanted a life of high achievement. God, I can conquer the world with a little bit of your help, but I can conquer the world. God is producing instead a life of patience. No one else here has a problem with that. Only me. I just thought I'll give you a little insight. I wanted a life of having my way, but God is producing instead a life of kindness. That is often the counterpart or the opposite to having my way. I wanted a life of success, don't you? God is producing instead a life of faithfulness. Fruits of the Spirit, the life of Jesus Christ. I wanted a life of strength God is producing 
Instead, a life of gentleness. And I wanted a life of gratification. But the life I never knew I wanted is the life God is producing instead, which is a life of self-control, fruits of the Spirit, the life of Jesus. I'm incapable of producing these, friend. I cannot do it of myself. I cannot do it. I can never point to the good work that I have done in my heart and in my life. I can never do that. I always can only point to him who does the good work in me. So that reminds me of a prominent college president who retired. And at his retirement, they had this big party, and they unfolded this portrait. Somebody had painted this picture of him, and he had the chance to express his gratitude and thank everyone for coming and thankful for the portrait and then he paid a well-deserved compliment to the person who painted the portrait, the artist. And here's what he said. He said that he believed that people looking at the picture would not ask, who is that man? But rather, who painted the picture? You see, that's similar to what Jesus said. Let your light so shine before men that seeing your good works will glorify that when they see your good works, they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me tell you something. When you get to heaven, there are going to be no peacocks strutting, boasting, showing off. No peacocks. Because a patient, after a major surgery, is a living testimony to the surgeon's skill, not the patient's endurance. And a condemned man, after a reprieve, is a testimony to the judge's mercy. And therefore, we are both exhibits of God's skill, and trophies of what? His mercy. Heaven's going to be full of God's trophies. Heaven is going to be full of evidence of God's skill. And that's going to be that He has taken sinners lost and condemned, and by His mercy, He has saved them, and by His skill, He has made them an exhibit of Jesus Christ. So what are we saying? I want you to take to heart, to consider this. Remind yourself often, my life is God's project. Would that be a good step to take? And I am God's handiwork, God's handiwork. I am. You feel bad, you feel a failure, you feel you've messed up, you feel you've just done it all wrong. You've taken many steps backward, that's the time to remind yourself, I am God's project. I am God's handiwork. God's deeds are becoming my deeds. So what must I do? What is my part? And here I want you to look at a drawing. God is up there. Me, the sinner, is down here. Look at that gap between us. You know what that gap is called? Sin separates us from God. How are we going to bridge that gap? Can we set up a ladder and climb up? Absolutely not. You know what? It's all by grace. And what's grace again? It's God doing what I cannot do and what I don't deserve Him doing for me. That's it. Now, you agree with that, don't you? On salvation. It's all by grace. But then what about this? where God's version of me is way above, and there's a huge gap between God's version of me and what I am. And if all I concentrate is on is what I am, I'm going to be very discouraged very often. Because that gap is really caused by sin, the same as anything. How are we going to bridge that? 
listen, I can just as well bridge the gap between God and me as I can bridge the gap between God's version of me and where I am. And that is, I cannot. Because sin is always in the way. But in the same way as God has bridged the gap of sin to save me by His grace through Jesus Christ, it's the same way in which God is doing His handiwork. It is also by grace. It's very hard for that to get through into our hearts. See, we are forgiven by grace. We are accepted by grace. We are declared right with God by grace. And we live by grace. We bear fruits by grace. God makes us live. God makes us live. Now, here's a true story. A news reporter shocked everyone who read his report. And here's his story. He said, police today are looking for the mother of a newborn infant found abandoned in a vacant field just off Interstate 45. The child, the third abandoned newborn found in Jefferson County this year, was left on a pile of garbage partially covered with a plastic bag containing the afterbirth. The newborn infant was found by Mr. Jesu Rodriguez, a temporary temporarily unemployed carpenter who was walking along the interstate collecting scrap metal and aluminum cans. Mr. Rodriguez said that he was attracted to the garbage pile by the child's cries and found the baby still covered with blood. Mr. Rodriguez picked up the small infant and quickly drove the child to the county hospital in his Ford pickup truck. He told hospital workers, I was so scared. I drove to the hospital as quickly as I could. I kept saying over and over again, please don't die, live. And that is the story pretty much of how we started our sojourn on this earth. Because the Bible graphically tells us in Ezekiel chapter 16 that God looks at His people whom He loves dearly, but who are in desperate trouble. And here's the story again. Ezekiel 16 verse 4, God says to you and to me and to all His people, He says, you were born, no one cared about you. Your umbilical cord was left uncut, and you were never washed, rubbed with salt to make the skin firm, and dressed in warm clothing. No one had the slightest interest in you. No one pitied you or cared for you. On the day you were born, you were dumped in a field and left to die unwanted. That's called being lost. That's called being desperate. That's called being helpless. But friend, it doesn't mean hopeless. Because Mr. Rodriguez found that child, rescued the child, said to the child, live. And here's the gospel in verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 16. God says, I came by and saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. As you lay there, I said, God said, live. So no matter, no matter where you find yourself today, no matter what your circumstances are, God says, live. Even though, even though you may feel like you are drowning in sorrow, God says, live. Even though you may feel that the addictions are slowly squeezing all life out of you, God says, live. 
Even though Satan's attacks make you feel like all is hopeless, God says, live. Even though the world lures you to live it up and then simply dumps you in a pit, hear God say, live. Live. And when God says live, He means a life filled with Jesus. Because a Christian is simply this. It is a mind through which Christ thinks. It's a heart through which Christ loves. A voice through which Christ speaks. A hand through which Christ helps. What a fulfilling life that is, friends. It's God's handiwork. He wants you to walk with Him while He does His work. I wish to declare to you today that the Christian life is not difficult to live. It is impossible. Because only Jesus has managed to live the Christian life to the full. Only Jesus. And that's exactly what He wants, not for you to do, but what He wants to do in you and through you. God help us to see the difference between us seeing to it that we live the full Christian life and letting Jesus live the full Christian life in us and through us. There is a difference, you know, and that difference is so crucial. It is a difference between burning out, giving up, or it is the life of submission, of walking with Him. Life to the full is simply a life full of Jesus. That's all it is.